And I go home and I write this feather theme. Every cue, let's try the feather theme. Didn't work anywhere until the feather came back. A movie like Back to the Future, I couldn't even look at a piece of film until I had the tune. The film speaks first. It says something to me and then I say something back to it. That's really how it feels for me. Bobbin, as you know, many know, was Bob Zemeckis. And Bob listened to the cassette, was very nice, thanked me for my time, and left the room. Whatever the tapes may have done, um, I just think it's so important to be in the room because after all, everything um, that happens is got to do with relationships. Let's talk about your creative process then mm -hmm. for a second. Where, where do your ideas come from? Mine come from the movie. And it's this incredible partner. And it's not the enemy. Although sometimes, you know, it can be perceived as, as such. It is the first, uh, the first gesture my way and everything is there. Um, and even if it's not, as a composer, but also as a viewer, we have to take this film into our apparatus. So that really is, for me, um, the start of it all. And it is where any ideas come from. I don't have any ideas, actually away from the film. For instance, a movie like Back to the Future, um, I couldn't even look at a piece of film until I had the tune. I just knew that about that film. Welcome all, welcome all. Here we are once again to talk about Grammy, Academy Award, Golden Globe, and Saturn Award and nominated Alan Silvestri. He's also an Emmy winner. <laughs> he is from the Berkeley College of Music. Worked as a drummer. But I probably know him from scoring numerous movies like Predator, Forrest Gump, Contact, The Frame Roger Rabbit, Flight, The Abyss, The Mummy Returns, and just various movies and TV, as well as the award winning uh, Cosmos Space Time Odyssey for 2014. So, <laughs> so when did he become uh, just get on your radar, John? was really his two classic films, Back to the Future and Prior, though. That's what got me into him. Yeah. Uh, he was kind of always on my radar, but he was, like, at the very back end. Like, somewhere in between James yeah. Newton Howard and James Horner. Just one of those other reliable guys who wasn't Hans Zimmer, who wasn't John Williams, but still. Just a bunch. And so... He, he did, I mean, just from 86, that's like his busiest year alone, where he just does all kinds of adventure films, canon films, yep. comedies, dramas, and even, you know, Disney's Flight of the Navigator. So, you know, just, I mean, so basically, aside from Predator, he's mainly Robert Zemeckis' go-to guy. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it just hasn't been Roger Rabbit, all the Back to the Futures, and 
but yeah, there were some other ones on here. I had no idea he did the bodyguard, Death Becomes Her, Ricochet, even John Hughes' hockey comedy Dutch. I'm <laughs> like, well, that, I guess that makes sense. Soap Dish, Judgment Night, even Super Mario Brothers, where he replaced Jerry Goldsmith because someone's got to score it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he also, he also did a race of Long Kiss Goodnight and plenty of others. Yeah, a lot of. A lot of Schwarzenegger movies are just kind of lowbrow fun films, but yeah, the Eraser one won him the BMI Film Award. Um, Mouse Hunt, I think I lost track. That might have been that, or Sergeant Milko might have been the first score I remember. <laughs> um, once again, replaced Jerry Goldsmith for a movie called Judge Dredd. So that says again. Um, you said you saw a Quick and the Dead the other night. Um, uh, how, what was your take on that score? <laughs> well, it's like a very intriguing take on a Western. He kind of had similar elements that you would hear in other Westerns, but he managed to make it his own without it sounding really generic, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. it, I it. Out of the various Marvel uh I didn't realize he did... Uh, Ready Player One, but I think he did a good job of copying John Williams as well as just kind of lending that its own kind of life. Um, I, I, the one I definitely recall the score for Identity. That one is very haunting, but yeah, I don't think one, I forgot he did. I remember that being very haunting. It does attention because mainly we're just paying too much attention to the movie itself. But um, even Cast Away, I mean, is one of his better noted scores. I think that was where he kind of just, instead of relying on a bunch of drums, he just kind of did more just kind of horns. Um, the one he does for the comedy Showtime, Benny Murphy and De Niro, I think kind of suffers a bit. It's just one of those where it's just like, again, the movie's not perfect. And so I think that's just part of it. It's just like, eh, maybe reel back a little bit on it. It's just, we're not supposed to take this all that seriously, even though this movie's kind of crazy. Yeah, that's what I don't always remember too well. It's yeah. meant to be a spoof, and yet at the same time, it's a little sloppy in how it all comes together. So it's one of those, it's like, okay, it's not perfect, but it's still somewhat entertaining. I definitely recall a lot of the... Uh, heavy music setups for Wolfgang Peterson Shattered, Young Guns 2, maybe a little bit of the jazz in downtown with Anthony Edwards and Forrest Whitaker. Uh, what do you think of his Saturn award nom for The Abyss? I have actually one score I actually think is quite underrated within his catalog. Kind of surprised he didn't work more with uh, what's his name? Uh, James Cameron Moore. <laughs> well, he wasn't actually pretty solid for Titanic, I would say, but I guess he didn't want to go with that type of composer. <laughs> Funny how it all works, this business, man. Yeah. So where would you rank him on your various? Well, it's weird. He's actually one of those composers that I wouldn't put him like in a top tier. He's more, I'd say, like in the middle. He's not one of my favorites, but he's definitely not one of the worst ones, of course. But Yeah, he'd be probably in my top 20 or 30, but he definitely wouldn't be in my top 10, and that's nothing personal. That's just, no. again, uh, even though I'm not going to get Hans Zimmer on there, I'm I'm such a bigger fan of James Horner, Mark Mancina, Tyler Bates, and even, again, some of the other ones we mentioned. <laughs> Trevor Raven, I think, is amazing. Yeah. Being in Yes does that sometimes. Um, That's true. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it's a pretty slam bang. Uh, this really does write itself. <laughs> and even starting out with the wacky cult crime comedy, The Doberman Gang, a bunch of TV movies, and then Stephen King's Cat's Eye. You know, it's like he was off to a start. And even just some of his other cult comedies like Summer Rental and it's just like Outrageous Fortune and like, yeah, he's set for life. He really is. He's just... He really is. Overall, I mean, 
yeah, just the Zemeckis stuff alone is just gonna knock it out of the park. <laughs> <laughs> well, that in Pride, though, I would say. Although I like to argue that Pride 2 score might be even better, but, you know. I know that'll be controversial, but. Yeah, Predator 2 does kind of get more moody and especially fast paced, like it's trying to both emulate cop procedurals as well as just city jungle stuff. And I wouldn't be surprised if he reused a lot of that for Stephen Hopkins' other movie, Judgment Night, the following year, you know? I think it's more subtle in Judgment Night, if I remember. It is. Oh, Most of it went to the rap soundtrack, which. <laughs> Ironically, was more popular than the movie itself, according to podcasting after dark. <laughs> uh, but yeah. yeah, he's got some disaster movie scores and other comedy stuff. Practical Magic, Holy Man, even Volcano. I think that's pretty cool. One of the Grumpy Old Men movies. I don't recall any of the scores for Paris Family or Ranger Games. I remember Ranger Games score. <laughs> okay. <laughs> But that's about all I can remember. I definitely don't remember the Mexican score for that. No, but in all fairness, that movie just doesn't work as a whole. What Lies Beneath, I do kind of recall a lot of the movie scores. It just needs a better movie. <laughs> yeah, that's what I would say. And Helsing, he got a few noms and won that ASCAP award for top box office films. I, I'm sorry, I really do not remember any of the scores, but he basically no, was no, still no. in Tomb Raider and Mummy 2 mode. And as for the animated movies, it's kind of interesting too. The Wild, which is just an independent uh, CGI film. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that one. Produced by Disney that. It just came out the wrong time. It's just it was trying to capitalize on Madagascar, but it was a fun movie in its own right. <laughs> oh well. I mostly remember his Avenger score for the first movie. That's all I remember for the Marvel related stuff he did. He failed. Mm-hmm. The rest of it's fairly forgettable, if you ask me. Yeah. Alan. <laughs> When he gets into the Marvel stuff, it just kind of doesn't help that he's sharing it with everyone. So it's easy to just all just all flows together. Mark Graham, and then you know, Avengers two, you got Brian Tyler and Danny Elfman. And then, uh, you know, I, I I forgot he did Red two because again, Christopher Beck was doing the main theme, and that's yeah. what you hear mainly throughout it. And obviously, a Christmas Carol. He's I don't think I ever really saw it, and I definitely. Wouldn't a score like that just because the movie's just not evolving so again you know it's just we have nothing against that. <laughs> yeah I just yeah. nothing against him and he had a decent intro he was on campy stuff like Scarcity and Hutch and Chips and then Animal of all <laughs> shows and then mm -hmm. after an episode each of Amazing Stories and TJ Hugger he then goes on to tell from the crypt so I'm like nah nice I would actually be interested in seeing uh, which one you know, exact episodes he scored. <laughs> I can see as well, because I know I've probably seen them. Oh, hold on. I, I mean, it lists it, but I like... Uh, okay, Yellow and Beauty Rest and You Murderer are some of the many. But yeah. But, uh, Yellow is actually an uh, underrated score for television, I would say. Alright. Uh, we'll be on the lookout for when I do a rewatch. Good, good. It's like Zemeckis directing, so... How ironic. <laughs> there you go. All right, so his upcoming role is on Disney's <laughs> inevitable live action movie Pinocchio. And of course, again, it's a Zemeckis joint, so. Of course. I will be skipping that one, but I wish all the best <laughs> to everyone. Sorry, guys, we're cynical Fox. We just. <laughs> you need something new. For doing the same stuff, just doesn't do it. Um, they just don't have the wild folks, just saying. Mm -hmm. But yeah, recent ones, I definitely recommend the score for Flight. It just, it, it didn't even, it could have been by anyone and it would have worked. You know, it was by Zemeckis, but it's just a damn good, just did he or didn't he, you know, commit a, you know, 
accidental homicide, you know, while flying a plane, and just the whole thing is just... I mean, you kind of remember some of the jazz in it, but, I mean, it really is just... Near the end, it gets far more visceral, where you're just like, uh, I'm really questioning how I feel about this man. (laughs) Do I fear him? Do I... uh, hate him? Do I have reasonable doubt? I don't know. And it's just a complex role. Last time I get to that one, not well one day. It's just another one that just basically, it just flew under the radar. It just did not uh, I mean, it got a reasonable amount of praise, but (laughs) just don't see as many people talk about it. I'm definitely not anymore, huh? that has been mostly forgotten. We'll return after these messages. The Jacked Up Review Show podcast is honored to be part of the Blind Knowledge Podcast Network. Join anytime, talk the talk, and enjoy yourselves. There's something enlightening for everyone with this crowd of cool cats. Check them out. Hey, it's Brent Pope, the host of Breakfast with Brent Pope. You've seen me on some of your favorite TV shows saying things like, give it up, Jimmy. You got to sink this putt to win. On Breakfast with Brent Pope, I sit down with guests from the entertainment world and we do it all over breakfast. Or should I say breakfast? Every week on Breakfast, you get inside Hollywood info and tips, great breakfast wrecks and booty debates. Most of all, you get the most delightful 30 minutes of your week. So dig in. It's breakfast time. Listen at breakfast.com, Apple Podcasts, or wherever fine podcasts are found. Do you ever find yourself thinking about who would win in a fight between Goku and Superman? Hi, I'm James Gavsey, and on the Who Would Win show, me and my co-host Ray ignore anything important happening in the outside world and debate fictional battles between characters from comics, movies, and video games. We got a new show every week, and almost always, am I the winner? (laughs) Yeah, not true, Ray. In the past, we've discussed such matches as Captain America vs. Darth Vader, Solid Snake vs. the Iron Giant, classic matchups like Robocop vs. Terminator, and even the Muppets vs. Sesame Street. That one was crazy. So if you're a fan of geek culture and love a spirited debate, check out the Who Would Win Show wherever you get your podcasts or check us out at whowouldwinshow.com. Follow us on the web on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. The podcast is available on Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Anchor, Apple, and anywhere else podcasts are available. Feel free to review our show and leave comments on any of those sites. Thanks a million for listening. It's a